yonder in there. I'm a northerner. I'm learning the language of the South. It's interesting. I, w- I was helping a, a doctoral student up at Southeastern who just finished. Uh, he's from the Dominican Republic, and so Spanish is his primary language. And I was asking about his interaction with our culture because uh, it took him six years to do his doctoral work. It normally takes three to four because he did everything in Spanish and then had it translated into English. And so I said, how many languages have you learned? He goes, I can speak five. And he, he mentioned them, French and Spanish and English. And he goes, and I've learned a new one, Southern. <laughs> and I said, I'm not the only one that thinks that way. So that's good to know. There is, there is definitely a distinct uh, vocabulary that exists in the South that um, is different from, the, well, not just from the North, but you go to the North, you go to the Midwest. I think we were talking about the other day, I'm not sure if it was in class or not, we were talking about some people call a soda a soda, and some people call it pop. My wife, when I met her, she asked me to get her, she's from the South, and said, could you get me a Coke? And so I went to the, got, and came out with a Coke. She goes, no, I wanted uh, a root beer. I said, you said a Coke. Well, in her mind, Coke equals soda, and then you have to delineate what type of Coke that is. So yeah, it's definitely a, a different language that we have. Our missionaries in focus tonight are the uh, Connie Ware Evangelistic Association and Miss Allison Ware. As her, Connie was her husband. He's passed on. Uh, it's interesting because she's been doing work in the Ukraine for decades. And guess what country is in, in desperate need of the gospel and, and help? And so She's interacting with them on a regular basis. Uh, during COVID, she was doing it uh, through Zoom. Um, I think she did a trip before Russia invaded the Ukraine, if I remember reading her letter correctly. But pray for her as she interacts and it brings the, the word of God and encouragement to the people of the Ukraine. Uh, every month, we like to focus on a different passage of Scripture. It's a new month, so a new passage of Scripture for us to look at. Psalm chapter 50, verses 10 to 14. This is God speaking. And he says, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. You know what he's saying? I own it all. And I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. No means he has understanding, intimacy with it. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, uh, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. That last part is really important. Can you give God anything? Does He need anything from us? But what does He desire from us? Thankfulness. And thankful people keep their word to God. So it's better not to vow a vow at all, Ecclesiastes warns us, than to make a vow to God and to not keep it. And so if we're thankful, we will be giving people. And so as you look at our budget, and you look at the bulletin here, you'll notice that we are above budget. Now, why is that? Because you've been faithful to follow the Lord's direction, and we're able to help people out. You'd be surprised how many um, people we get knocking at the door during the week who need assistance with various things. Just this last week, we helped somebody move into an apartment. Um, They were living in a mold-infested trailer for many months now. Florence did wonders on a lot of housing units around here. We were able to pay for the truck and the gas, which cost more than the truck, believe it or not. Uh, and they only made a short trip, but uh, uh, we were able to, to help out with things like that. Because of your faithfulness, we have a little bit extra in the budget that we're able to help out. We're able to, missionaries in the Philippines might say, hey, we're, we're working on this issue right here, and we're able to send them a love gift. Um, our, our Japanese ladies had that uh, bento box sale, and we raised $2,500. That's not part of your budget. That's extra that we were able to send straight to the Ukraine to, through the Baptist men. Who, are, who have interaction there. And so aren't you glad that we have a God who doesn't need anything from us but desires for us to give? And why does he want to do, does to do that? So that we will learn that everything belongs to him. Too many of us think that what's in our pocket, our wallet, our checking account belongs to us. Now we're just stewards. It belongs to him. And someday we have to give an account for what we saved and what we spent and why we spent it and what we gave. Um, and guess what? We're one day closer to doing that. And so we, it, it would behoove us to take a look at our stewardship and say, are we good stewards or are we poor stewards? Good stewards put God first. And that's important. So thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. Let's pray for Miss Allison as she 
interacts with the people of Ukraine. Father, we are so thankful that we can be thankful. Lord, you have given us everything, not just salvation, but the breath that we breathe, the, this air-conditioned building, light and electronics that work, and we, uh, cars that run, and food that's uh, healthy, and water that's not dirty. And we can just go down the list all day long, Lord, and just thank you for the many, many gifts that you've given us. We do thank you most of all for the gift of salvation, and the fact that you've taken our sins upon your Son on the cross. And Lord, given us your righteousness in its stead. May we be a people who are thankful all the time. And may it not just be in our mouth, but may it be in our actions as well. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. As I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a parenthesis. Does anyone need an outline? Um, we don't have a lot. I'm sure we got some more. If you didn't get one, Brother Bob will take care of you. And so what we've, quick recap, back to chapter 1, John has a vision, he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he sees a vision of the resurrected Christ. If you, under, if you know why John is on Patmos, you would understand why this book was written. John was on Patmos because he was standing for the Lord, taking a stand and preaching the gospel, and the Roman government didn't like it. So they exiled him. Now John is the only apostle who wasn't martyred. But it wasn't for lack of trying. They boiled him in oil, and he lived. Now, you want to talk about pain. Ever burned yourself on something? Imagine your body. I don't know how much of your body was uh, encapsulated, but it, I'm sure, it, and I don't think they had a whole lot of uh, essential oils or whatever they used back then to take a wine and oil like we were talking about in, in the question and answer time. So he's in pain. He's on Patmos, and, and God shows up to him, and, and, and when Jesus shows up to him, he comes in a vision of the glorified Jesus. Why? Because when you undergo persecution, you've got to ask yourself the question, is it worth it? Is Jesus really coming back? Or is that just fake? Now, we can disagree whether we're pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, um, pre-trib, post-trib. Remember I did that whole lesson for you at the beginning right there? Um, Pan-trib is all going to pan out in the end. But we know this for a fact. Everyone in all the views knows this. Jesus is coming again. And based on that fact, um, we can live a life now, even though it may be temporarily difficult, that you may undergo trials and persecution, it will be worth it because Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, guess who he's coming for? His bride, his church. Chapters 2 and 3, um, so Jesus told John in chapter 1, I want you to take these seven letters to the churches these seven churches, literal churches. Remember, John was on Patmos, Ephesus was here, and he just worked his way up to Smyrna and Pergamos and all the way across down, so he eventually ended up in Laodicea. All seven of those churches were real churches that really needed to hear the message. All seven of those churches are, are like types of churches that have always existed. And so we spent a good uh, nine, ten weeks just going through those and looking. By the way, if you've ever missed a message, you can go online uh, to our website, centerviewbaptistchurch.com, and you can listen to any uh, of the messages that Pastor Mike or I do. They're on there. Uh, or, and we also have a YouTube channel. Now, the YouTube channel, what you'll get is everything from announcements to the final song. On the website, we try to just put the sermon because of copyright issues and things like that. We don't want to get bumped off. In chapter 4, we were in heaven. John wakes up with a vision in heaven, and he sees the Father. And the Father is surrounded, he's on his throne, and he's surrounded by 24 elders and four angels, and they're all bowing down and worshiping and praising him because he's the creator. And in chapter 5, around that same throne, we also see the Lamb, the Son. And he's praised because he's the, the, the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And he's the one who brings salvation to the earth. And so he's being praised for being the one who brings salvation. And every creature on earth and, and in heaven, they all begin to praise him. John sees in God the Father's hand a scroll, the title deed to the universe, and it's got seven seals on it. Those seals, um, the person who can open those seals has to, is the one who has the authority of that scroll to make happen what's supposed to happen in that scroll. And John begins to weep. 
because as he looks across the entire universe, there's no one who's worthy to open the seal. And the Bible says he wept much. The only place in, in the book of Revelation where tears are shed in heaven. But then he's told by one of the angels, weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Jesus' death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, gave him the authority to open those seals. He bought back the earth from the fall. If you remember in Genesis 3, humanity rebelled against God. And so Satan, the prince of the power of the air, was quote-unquote in charge. And when Jesus died on the cross, read Colossians chapter 1, Jesus defeated him who had death, the power of death. And Jesus uh, embarrassed, um, I'm trying to think of the right word from Colossians, but he, now I can't go on until I get the right word in my head or I'll uh, be thinking about that the whole time I'm trying to give you the, the rest of the message. That's the danger of having a brain that goes 30 miles an hour. All right. It says, for by him all things were created, they're in heaven and earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might have the preeminence in all things. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things in earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. I want to keep reading here. And you who were once alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So what's the idea here? Jesus embarrassed. Jesus destroyed the power of the, the, the devil. Hebrews 2.14 says the same thing. By his death on the cross, he was able to reconcile us, buy us back, bring us back in. He has the power to open up those seals. And starting in chapter 6, we began to do that. Remember, the first seal that we opened up was false peace. Then after that, with the second seal. And by the way, these seals are opened up during the time that we call the tribulation period. That seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel. That You can look at Daniel 9, 24 to 27. I'm not going to redo that. You can go back and listen to that. And as we work through this seven years, the seals are going to be opened up, and then we're going to have some trumpets and then some bowls. The closer we get to the end of that seven years, the more rapidly these things will be opened up and, and, and poured out, and the more destructive they will be. By the time we get to that last three and a half years, that's called the Great Tribulation. We saw that in, in uh, the sixth seal. So we just kind of passed that sixth seal, the middle part of the three and a half years, we started with false peace, and then there was war, and then there was famine, and then there was death, the first four seals, and then there were the souls under the altar crying out to God, how long, holy and just and true God, until you avenge our blood? And then last week we looked at the, at the sixth seal when um, the, he had a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth, sackcloth, the moon became like blood, the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs. The sky receded as a scroll, and every mountain, every island moved out of its place. Basically, the whole universe was in a mess, and people began to become terrified. By the end of chapter 6, you have the kings and the, of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man. They hide themselves from the, le and, and, and they cry out to the rocks, hide us from the, from the, the, the wrath of the Lamb. Hide us from God and the wrath of the Lamb. That's where they're at. That's where we've left off. The last question in verse 17 says this. The great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? As we get to chapter 7, we're going to find out who is able to stand. So I'd like to read the first 12 verses here. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. 
Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Aren't you glad to see this after chapter 6? We enjoyed chapters 4 and 5. There's praise going on in heaven. In chapter 6, it's a mess. We're going back up to heaven now. We're no longer on the earth. We're going back up there. What's going on here? Why is um, John talking about the preservation of the people? Is that a theme that we see see throughout Scripture? If you start in the book of Genesis and begin to work your way through, you're going to find out before God brings down wrath, A, he brings down multiple warnings, and B, he takes care of his own And then he brings down wrath. Let me give you some examples. When God destroyed the earth in a flood, what did he tell Noah to do? And build an ark. And for 120 years, he's out there not going to Lowe's or Home Depot, but doing it on his own with his sons and their wives. Eight people and and his wife. Eight people, righteous people, doing what they were told to do. And God preserved them through the... Even though there was a flood going on on the outside, where were they? They were on the inside being protected. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes down to Abraham and says, I'm about to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham prays, Lord, if you find 50 righteous people there, will you save the city? He says, yes. If you find 40 righteous people, will you save the city? Yes. 30, yes. 20, yes. 10, yes, I'll save it if I find 10 righteous people. Guess what? He couldn't even find 10. But who was there that was righteous? Lot and his family. Well, Lot and his daughters, and we can be really questionable about his daughters, but they were pulled out of that city, were they not? Kicking and screaming, basically, but God preserved them. And I wouldn't have even known that Lot was saved. I would have questioned that, except when you get to the New Testament, it talks about that righteous Lot whose soul was vexed every day. When he destroyed Jericho in Joshua, in the beginning of Joshua, there's a young lady named Rahab, the prostitute, that God preserved, and her family. And what was hung out her window? A scarlet cord. And then anyone who was in that house, what happened to them? The nation of Israel is in the land of Egypt. And God says, let my people go to Pharaoh. And plague after plague after plague comes. And the last plague, the the death of the firstborn, God says, if you will take a a lamb and you will slay this lamb, a one-year-old lamb that's spotless, and put the blood on the lentil and on the doorposts, when I see that blood, I will pass over you. And so those Jewish believers who did that, their sons were preserved. There's a history of God taking care of his people as he begins to bring down. Now, by the way, what happened to the rest of the Egyptians? The firstborn of everyone from Pharaoh down to the lowest slave was killed. And then what happened to them when they chased the, um, the, Israel, the Jews in the, in the wilderness? The entire army was drowned in, in the Red Sea. As God preserved his people by putting the, making the winds blow the, the water so they could cross on dry land and keeping a cloud between the Egyptian army and them. God's in the preservation business. That, that's what God does. The tribulation is going to be a time of unparalleled judgment and disaster and death. 
But we're also going to see it's going to be a time of unparalleled salvation. I believe more people will be saved during this seven-year period than any other time in history. Because um, when the sun begins to mess up and the stars and uh, earthquakes and you see billions of people starting to die, uh, you begin to think that all these things that you thought were important aren't very important anymore. And you're going to look up to the heavens. We've already seen a bunch of martyrs there in chapter 6. There will be some believers who will die from some of these, from wars and from famine, from natural disasters. Others will die from antichrist persecution. But their deaths are not a result of God's wrath. They are just, just like now. If God wants to take you home, he's going to take you home. Okay? Many believers, however, will not die. We're going to, we just read about 144,000 of them. They're going to survive because they're going to populate in the millennial kingdom. So after the seven years, Revelation 20 talks about a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. Not everyone agrees that's literal. I happen to believe it is. I don't see any figurative language there. There's no like or as. And so there are going to be believers who are going to go through the tribulation, who get saved during the tribulation, who go through it. Some of them will make it into. God's going to seal these 144,000. By God putting his seal on them means that the Antichrist can't mess with them. He can't do anything to them. Um, you can read about this uh, Jesus in Matthew 25 when he talks about the judgment of the goats and, and the sheep in Matthew 25, 31 and following. The goats are the unsaved. They're going to be cast into hell, uh, but the sheep will be saved. And Jesus is going to say, come to, who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. I believe that's talking about this group of people here. Many of the people who will be saved, we're gonna, we saw after verse 8, they're not all Jews. There's going to be some Gentiles saved, some non-Jewish people saved. But it's going to be primarily a time of Israel's redemption. I don't have time today to develop that, but you can read about that in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, all the way through chapter 13, verses 1, and then verses 8 and 9, where God makes a prophecy, and I'll finish it with this. These are my people. They will say, I am their God. And I'll give you a couple of verses before that. It will come about in that land, declares the Lord, that two parts of it will be cut off and perish, but one third will be left in it, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver uh, to be refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call upon my name, and I will answer them. So if I read that right, two-thirds of the nation of Israel is going to be killed, wiped out, non-believers. And then you're going to have a third who are going to be persecuted become believers, and God's going to bring them through the fire and bring them into um, the millennial reign. In Romans chapter 11 in the New Testament, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are, it's an interesting book, the book of Romans. Um, the first three chapters deal with sin, then you have salvation, and then you have sanctification, where now that we're saved, now we're acting more and more like Christ. And then we have the concept of security, that a, a true believer will never, ever lose their salvation. We see that in chapter 8. Then chapter 9, 10, and 11 are kind of a, a parenthesis because the people who are being saved, the Gentiles are saying, wait a minute, Lord, if we're secure, then why did you set aside the nation of Israel? You told them they were secure too. And so in chapter 9, we look at Israel past. Chapter 10, we look at Israel present. Chapter 11, we look at Israel in the future. And he says, not all Israel is Israel. But then at the end of chapter 11, he talks about the Gentiles being grafted in and all that. At the end of chapter 11, he says this, all Israel will be saved. Earlier on in that chapter, he says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. When God says something, he's going to make it to happen. Um, by the way, all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The, the, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. So part of what God's doing uh, and during this tribulation period, and you can read about it in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, is he is bringing an end on all the unrighteousness. He's punishing it, the sin that exists. Um, Daniel 9, 20, I, I don't know why I'm rushing. We'll just pick this up next time. I'm not going to rush. 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24, are determined for your people in your holy city. Here's the purpose. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Then anointing the most holy, that's when Jesus comes to rule and reign on the earth. So that, that first 69 weeks have already happened. From the decree to the rebuilding of the wall from, from Cyrus, when the wall was torn down in the nation of the city of Jerusalem, till when the Messiah comes in 
the week before his crucifixion was exactly 483 Jewish years or 69 weeks to the day. Then there's a parenthesis. The Jewish nation rejected Jesus as their Messiah as a whole. And so now the, the, the church is now grafted in. The church being all saved people from Jews and Gentiles. That's temporary. This is the age of grace, the church age. That's a temporary thing because God's got one more week of sevens that he's going to have to finish that up. That's the tribulation period that we're looking at in, in the book of Revelation. And the reason I keep going back is I want you to see it's a big, there's a lot going on. The other 65 books of the Bible are being fulfilled in this last book. Did you ever read a book that was missing pages? We were in Iraq, we would get all these paperbacks and then we, you'd start reading and all of a sudden you get to the end and there's a whole section missing. It's really frustrating. You know what's even worse than that? If you only have the end and you don't know what happened before that. So knowing how all this fits together is really important. That's why I'm going back and forth. So in these first eight verses, we're going to see some survivors, some, some Jews who are going to be given special protection. And so the first thing we see in verse 1 is God restrains his wrath. That phrase, after this or after these things, you see it there in verse 1. You see it in verse 9. You also see it in uh, Revelation 4.1, uh, Revelation 15.5, 18.1, and 19.1, that every time you see that phrase, it's introducing a new vision. Uh, something else is happening. Um, and what's going on here? The sh we're shifting from the ungodly on earth to the godly on earth. We're seeing a shift there. The first thing we see are four angels. Angels in Scripture are frequently associated with God's judgment. I wrote down 35 passages that I found. It's all the way through Scripture. You see angels and judgment going together. These four are given power over the elements of nature. They're standing at the four corners of the uh, earth holding the winds back. Now, some un skeptics say, well, see how, see how um, immature and uneducated Christians are. We all know the earth is round. What do you mean talking about four corners? North, east, south, and west. Dr. Morris uh, who is a scientist, said this. This verse has long been derided as reflecting a naive, pre-scientific concept of earth structure, one that supposedly viewed the earth as flat with four, corner, four corners. In terms of modern technology, it is essentially equivalent to what a mariner or a geologist would call the four quadrants of the compass, or the four directions. This is evident also from the mention of four winds, which in common usage would be, of course, north, south, east, and west winds. Parenthetically, accurate modern geodetic measurements in recent years have proved the Earth actually does have four corners. Th these are protuberances sticking out from the basic geoid, that is the basic spherical shape of the Earth. The Earth is not a perfect sphere, but it's slightly flattened at the poles. Its equatorial bulge is presumably caused by the Earth's axial rotation, and its four corners come from that. So technically, there's a little bit of a corner up on top, a little bit of a corner on the bottom, and a little bit of a corner each on the two parts of the equator. I don't think that's what we're learning here. It, it, I think it's figurative language is saying that they're in charge of the, the uh, elements from all directions. And what do they do? They stop the wind blowing. Now, you want to talk about some power. Think about what the wind controls on, on the earth. By the way, wind is almost always in Scripture associated with God's judgment. Jeremiah 49, 36, Daniel 7, 2, Hosea 13, 15, all mention that. Um, and so they're holding off God's judgment for a, for a time. Now when they're doing there's going to be no wind, no breeze, no waves breaking on the shore, because you need all that. Uh, no movement of the clouds. Everything will be deathly still. And the, it's interesting when you look at the Greek words here, uh, that holding back, they're holding it back, um, holding it in verse 1 there. That's a word that suggests struggling. Here's my best picture of that. Did you ever have a toddler who saw something they wanted or a dog that saw something they wanted and you got barely got control of that thing? And as soon as you let go, where's that dog or child going? That's kind of the picture here. They're holding on to these winds, but as soon as they let go, judgment's going to happen. When we get to chapter 8, verse 1, we're going to see that. The biggest miracle in the Bible is going to be silence in heaven for a half an hour. All those women are going to be quiet. One, two, three. It's 
see if you're awake. Ms. Vera's awake, okay. But when we get to chapter 8, we're going to see a whole bunch more happening, okay? So we see restraint. And then in verses 2 and 3, God is going to seal his servants. Um, he, he says, I'm going to put the seal of the living God on them. A seal is kind of like the, the picture is a signet ring. Back in the day, kings would do that. They would, they would seal their letters. That was their signature. They would dip it in wax. They would seal it, uh, a piece of it, and they would boom, and that would say, this is from the king. This has my signature on it. So here's God saying these 144,000, already believers, by the way, they're already um, his, but he's guaranteeing, um, he's saying, these are my people. These, these, are, these, are, these are, and he goes through 12 different tribes. Now, it's interesting because some people will say, well, these are, these are re- this is really the church, or um, this is very figurative. It's not really um, 144,000 people. It's really interesting because when you look at the times when the tribes are mentioned in Scripture, there are 19, 19 different uh, orders uh, or of the 12 tribes. There's not every time it's mentioned it's the same 12, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so let me give you some examples of that. In the Old Testament, you have lists sometimes by order of birth, like in Genesis 29. Other times, the order of Jacob's blessing them, Genesis 49. The order of encampment, Numbers 2. The order of census before the invasion of Canaan, Numbers 26. The order of blessing and cursing, Deuteronomy 27. The order of Moses' blessing, Deuteronomy 33. The order of the princes, Numbers 1. The order of inheritance, Joshua 13. The order by the wives and concubines, 1 Chronicles 2. And the order by the gates of the city, Ezekiel 48. I'm just trying to show you that not every time the list is given, it's going to be the exact same 12 tribes that are mentioned. So are these symbolic? Are they the church or are they real tribes? Um, I think the evidence is pretty clear. Um, I like what Dr. Thomas says about it. He says there's no clear-cut example of the church being called Israel in the New Testament or in ancient church writings until the year 160. This fact is crippling to any attempt to identify Israel as the church in Revelation 7. Furthermore, such an attempt becomes more ridiculous because it necessitates typological interpretation that divides the church into 12 tribes. So which tribe are you in the church? Okay. Even with all the irregularities in that list. So I believe, I think it's very clear that it's not the church because he names 12 tribes. He says 145. There's no like, there's no as. These are very specific um, tribes that he's delineating. I don't know why Judah appeared before Reuben, other than maybe it's because the Messiah came from the line of Judah, and Reuben messed up uh, when he was alive. I don't know why Levi is included, possibly because he was, Levi was God's chosen people. Remember, they weren't allowed to have any land. God says, I've claimed Levi for myself. Um, I don't know why, for a fact, why Dan and Ephraim are left out. Although, if you read the Old Testament, there are times uh, in, e- in Ezekiel and other places in Judges where Dan and Ephraim are like the leaders of, let's go to the idolatry club. So it's very possible. So these 12,000 are being sealed for the tribulation period to go into the millennial reign. But all the tribes, whether Dan and Ephraim, will also be included once you get into the millennial reign. Does that make sense? So these are just 12,000 that will be preserved through the tribulation. Why is that important? I said, Mark, that's really exciting. That's going to make my whole week. I'm going to live this week knowing about these 12,000 tribes and this is going to make a difference in my life. It's important because God keeps his word. If you read the 900 and some odd chapters of the Old Testament, and you start from Genesis chapter 12, when God starts over with one man, Abraham. Let me give you a quick Old Testament survey in five minutes. Ready? Go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was good, very good, right? And he made man, and, and, and man decided, he gave him one rule. You can eat of every tree of the garden, but one tree you can't eat, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat thereof, you will surely die. What do Adam and Eve do? Of course, they're going to eat from it. And the whole earth is plunged into death. 
from there you have you had the creation, you had the fall, you have the flood. Why did the flood happen? Because the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. They just wouldn't listen to God. They kept rebelling. God saved eight people, wiped out the rest of the earth. And then you have the Tower of Babel. Four events. Why the Tower of Babel? Because the God told the people to scatter, to go out into the whole earth. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to all come together. And we want to build a temple to God. And God says, oh, I'm going to scatter your languages. I'm going to change your languages so that you have to scatter. And starting at four events. And the rest of Genesis, and all the way through the rest of the, the Old Testament, is God starting over with one man, Abram, to bring forth one nation, Israel, to bring forth one Savior, Jesus Christ. And every time you see a nation or a tribe or a, tr or a group of people, from there on in the Old Testament, it's their interaction with God's chosen people. And God gives them unconditional promises and covenants, and I don't have time to develop all those. But Abraham was promised that from him all the nations would be blessed. David is given that same promise, also said that from him, that the, the line of Judah, there would be a king, the Messiah would come. And when you get to the New Testament, guess who fits that category in Matthew and in Luke's genealogies? Jesus traces himself all the way back there. There are also several prophecies given in the Old Testament talking about the Messiah and where he would be born and uh, how he would die and all these kinds of things. And they all came to pass. And so this is important. If God says something and it comes to pass, we can trust him. But if God says these 99 things happened and we find out this one didn't happen and will never happen, then you can't trust him. And you can read through the Old Testament, you're going to find out very clearly God's people are Israel. And God's not done with Israel. And there's some promises that God's given Israel that have not happened yet. If I can't trust God to keep his promises to Israel, how can I trust God to take my soul to heaven? Because the same God made that promise. And so as we work through this, and one of the main reasons why I'm pre-tribulation and pre-millennial is I see God keeping his word and the importance of God keeping his word literally. I'm not making it symbolic. I'm not saying, well, he really meant this, but he meant instead of that. There are places in, in Revelation where we see like and as, and we see symbols, and, and, I'll, and I'll develop those. But when God's being specific, and especially if it's fulfilling a, a previous pr promise, that should give you encouragement. It's been 4,000 years, but God's still keeping his promise. He doesn't keep them as fast as we'd like. We want it in two commercials, 20 minutes or less. No reruns or no, no next season come back. We don't want any cliffhangers, but that's not how God works. That encourages me to know that God promised Israel, even though they're ungodly. Malachi 3.6, I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Israel are not consumed. That's a great verse. God doesn't change. We jack it up all the time. The nation of Israel messed it up all the time. And before we pick on them, guess what? We mess up all the time. Your salvation is not based on you. Your salvation is based on what Jesus did on the cross. Everything he did, if he's imperfect in any way, shape, or form, if he tells a lie at all, then he cannot be God. Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. And so if God has promised something, it must come to pass. So as I look at these 144,000, I see God keeping his word to the nation of Israel. He's going to preserve them through the tribulation. He's getting them set up for the kingdom. This is the fulfillment of Matthew 24 and 25 of several Zechariah and Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament. The, uh, we're going to find out in Ezekiel, the, there's nine chapters at the end of Ezekiel that talk about the rebuilding of a temple that hasn't happened yet, a literal temple. Well, that's not going to happen unless God preserved Jews, right? It's really interesting. There was one historian who said, the reason I believe that the Bible is God's word is because of the nation of Israel. How many Hittites you seen lately? Jebusites, Hivites, Philistines, Amorites, Ammonites, Moabites, all the other ites in the Old Testament. They're all gone. But there's one little nation. Keep, even after Hitler and others and Stalin and every place they go, they get attacked. They're still being attacked. You know what? God is still keeping them around. Why is that? God keeps his word. And so I hope that encourages you when you don't feel saved, when you're like, what's taking God so long? Or why isn't this happening the way I, I think it should happen? God keeps his word. Notice in verses 9 to 12, not just Jews, but all nations, tribes, tongues, and people. And we're standing before the Lord saying, salvation belongs to our God. 
and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. And then all y'all, that's a good southern version of this, the angels stood around the throne, the elders, the four living creatures, they fall on their faces, and they praise God. And that should be how Christians act on a regular basis. Thank you, Lord, for keeping your word. Thank you, Lord, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and might, a sevenfold blessing belongs to God. He's our God forever and ever. Amen. You notice they're standing in white robes. Those white robes are given to them. They represent righteousness. You don't want to go to God with your robes. You want to go with God with his righteousness. And so here we see a picture of God not just taking care of the Jews. Remember, the Jews' purpose in the Old Testament was to be a light to the Gentiles. And they failed. And so God says, you know what? By the time we get to the end of Revelation, you're going to do the job the right way. These 144,000 are going to preach the gospel and millions will be saved. Finally, they're going to obey God. We'll see more about that when we get to chapter 9. But this was encouraging to me because God says, I just need to confirm in your mind while all this is wrath, all this wrath is going on that I'm, I have a purpose. It's not out of control. This is something I promised in the Old Testament that I'm fulfilling now. This wrath is promised, but also salvation is promised. And I'm giving you that salvation. Two sides. You're either on God's side or the devil's side. When he talked to the Pharisees in John 8, he says, you are the father of the devil. And the lust of your father you, you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. So you're either, when you're born, we're born, as Pastor talked about this morning, we're born in sin. We're born spiritually dead. We're born in Adam's family. We're born following Satan. And Christ redeems us from that, brings us into a new family, gives us a new name. A, a new heart, a new spirit, and now we're in a different family. And one of the marks of a person in the family of God is that they're thankful and that they praise the Lord. And I pray that's your heart. We will not have a service next week. In two weeks when we get together, we're going to pick up in verse 13, and we're going to go all the way to the end of this chapter. It's, the, it's fun. This is the good part. Give yourselves grace, though, because when we get to chapter 8 and 9, it's going to kick right back in again. But there's a purpose behind all this. When we're all done in chapter 22, we're going to say, he makes all things new. That's why I call this, call this title. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more tears. And everything will be fixed. God's way. Lord, thank you for your word and what we've learned in it. Help us to be, as believers, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And if someone here does not yet know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that this message will be uh, an impetus to push them towards your spirit and towards repentance. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Brother John.